Good morning, it's Lisa with Lisa Heal Yourself and today we're going to talk about shame. Now I've done many videos on shame before so for those of you who haven't um, seen my videos on shame, go check it out because it's the foundation for what we're going to talk about here. Deep shame, healing shame. What is shame? I want to talk about shame as it's being used as a tactic to weaponize people and particularly shame um, surrounding everything going on right now in the world. As we all know, anyone who's ever suffered from deep shame, deep chronic shame, knows that it affects your health. It can cause many diseases. It can keep you in chronic pain. It can keep you having chronic illness keeps you hurt from mental illness from sexual abuse from sexual assault shame for your race shame for your religion shame for how you feel like shame hurts people in so many ways physically emotionally mentally psychologically shame is lethal so it's important that we understand what shame is and how it is being used right now this contributes to shaming there is so much shaming going on surrounding everything that's currently going on in the news right now, everything that's currently facing our world. And I think we need to talk about it. And again, please watch those videos if you haven't yet seen my videos on shame. Because when I talk about shame from a personal perspective, when I talk about it from a perspective of chronic illness, or chronic pain or chronic suffering, the epidemic that we have of a loneliness in today's world, feeling abandoned, feeling isolated. These are all mechanisms of being shamed. Let's do a quick overview about what shame is. So shame is an extremely painful feeling, an extremely painful emotion. Not only is it an emotion, but it can also be uh, distress. Shame can cause you physical, emotional, psychological, mental distress. So it's a feeling, it's an emotion, it's a distress signal, and it's caused by feeling like you are wrong. It's caused by somebody pointing at you and feeling like you, your behavior, the person that you are, everything about you is bad, wrong, worthy of um, abandonment, worthy of being isolated from the rest of your tribe or society, and worthy of for you to hide. So people who have feel deep shame often hide. They don't want their truth exposed, whatever that truth may be, right? If somebody feels shame for being gay, for instance, they will hide the fact that they're gay because it's too shameful to bring up into the open because not only would being gay be wrong, but them as a person would be wrong, would be judged, would be criticized, and would be looked down on upon the rest of society, thus being shunned or isolated, abandoned from people who love you. People who are sexually abused, people who have chronic illness, people who believe in a certain religion, people who have a certain color of skin. We've seen over past, um, you know, throughout history, shaming ceremonies, marching people through the streets um, in order to shame them, to publicly shame these people into feeling humiliation, embarrassment, abandonment, and this leads to isolation, hiding, and loneliness. It leads to people feeling unloved and unlovable. So it is one of the most painful emotions and what it is one of the most damaging emotions. So I can speak firsthand. I have suffered with chronic shame, particularly around my chronic illness. And for years, maybe three, four years, I could no longer look people in the eye. I could no longer answer, answer a simple question. Hi, how are you doing today? I couldn't meet their eyes and I couldn't answer the question. I would look away. I would recoil because I couldn't meet people's eyes anymore because I felt so abandoned and so isolated due to my chronic illness and my condition because I felt like it was my fault 
So people who feel shame often feel like they're to blame, like it's their fault, like they never should have let whatever happened happened. Like they're being like the people who are abandoning them or shaming them aren't the people who are wrong, but they are the people who are wrong. They shouldn't have that color skin. They shouldn't have that religion. They shouldn't be that race. They shouldn't have that sexual abuse or that experience. They shouldn't have been violated in that way. They shouldn't have got the chronic illness. They shouldn't have, you know, whatever it is. There's a lot of shame, like it was my fault. It is my fault because maybe I could have done more. Shame is very, very toxic. Okay, it's toxic to your emotions. It's tox toxic to your mental state. It's toxic for your ability to, to communicate effectively and to make connections in the world and to be a valued member of society. When we feel shamed, we feel wronged. And when we feel wronged, we feel bad. And when we feel like we are unworthy of love or acceptance, we feel like life might not even be worth living. And that's why I say that shame is lethal. So what's been going on during the pandemic has been an attack, a coordinated attack of shame. There are people out there doing the shaming. There are people out there standing by and allowing the shaming. There are people who are the ones that are being shamed and there are the ones who are coordinating the effort of shaming. So this pandemic of shame is really multifaceted, but we're going to try to break it down. I think it's important that we, we, we look at it from a micro picture and we look at it from a macro picture to understand what is truly happening, what our responsibility is in this, how we can stop this shame cycle from happening how we can stand up if we're feeling shamed and how we can stop if we are the ones shaming. So first of all, sh feeling shame is often a helpful emotion, okay? And it's not, it's never really a helpful emotion, but the reason why we have shame as human beings is because it teaches us as we're growing up, what is good, what is acceptable, what is allowed, uh, in the eyes of the tribe and the society that we're growing up into. And it helps us create boundaries, uh, make boundaries, and define what is right, what is wrong, what is acceptable, what is unacceptable, and um, how we get, how we belong in this group. It, it gives us rules. You do this, you're accepted. You don't do this, you're not accepted. So as we grow up, shame is really a taught emotion. And it's taught because often it helps people survive, right? Parents shame their children, not in a mean way, but they shame them into forming their behaviors that will be acceptable in the eyes of society because we all know it's critical for survival to be accepted by society and be part of a larger group. Because even throughout evolutionary history, if you weren't part of the large group, you were subject to dying. You were subject to dying off, right? You wanted to be in that large herd, that large tribe. You didn't want to be some of the wild animals or somebody not in a big tribe. Because when you were attacked or when there was a disaster, you wouldn't have the support of the tribe and likely you wouldn't make it. So just... Evolutionary speaking, we are programmed to want to be part of this larger group, our tribe, society. We're programmed to want to fit in. And this is why most of us in society have people pleaser personalities, why we strive for perfectionism, why we put other people's needs ahead of our own, and why we really struggle with pleasing other people and making other people like us and trying to be liked and be good and be accepted and be wanted versus doing something that makes us happy or speaking our mind in a certain way or following our ideas or our dreams or our, our goals. A lot of people will put pleasing the needs of others ahead of their own because it's a vital, they feel it's vital 
um, to their acceptance and to their support and their love and their community and just strengthening up this, this bigger, broader safety net. This is on a deeper subconscious level. Of course, people don't know they're doing this, but everyone wants to feel safe in the world. It's That's the most biological need that we have is to feel safe. And when we feel fear, when we feel unsafe, um, our body will do anything it can in order to feel safe. So if we're not part of the bigger tribe, if we're not accepted or liked um, in the views of society, then we feel very, very unsafe and unstable and we will almost do anything to please, to please, I mean, you see it with kids at, in the schoolyard. They please the bullies. They try to please the, the popular kids. They try to please everybody so that they're liked. They wanna please their teachers. They wanna get good marks. They wanna please their parents. So we learn this at a very, very early age um, to change ourselves to mold ourselves into a certain way on what's acceptable, what's unacceptable. And this often keeps um, really good boundaries, right? Like it's not acceptable to kill someone. It is acceptable to, you know, feed the homeless. So these are good things that we learn because it keeps us in a boundary state. It keeps us from doing um, bad. It, it helps us learn good and evil. It helps us be accepted by our tribe. It helps us live within the rules um, that our tribe or our society is formed under. And this helps us live a, a connected life and it helps us feel safe and secure that we belong in our group. However, chronic shame is something that's an extended period of time. It's not that you've done a bad behavior and that you feel shameful about something that you've done. More or less, I would call that guilt. You feel guilty over something and um, you learn your lesson. You don't do that anymore because you know that that thing was wrong. But shame is when you feel that you are wrong, you are bad. So it's a difference between doing something wrong. Guilt and shame is like guilt is you've done something wrong and shame says that I think I am wrong. So, I mean, at a most basic level, we can talk about this uh, with a little child. Maybe a child who is potty training or learning to go to the bathroom and we put the child on the toilet and we praise them and we clap and we cheer and we say, good girl, good girl, good girl, when they go to the bathroom on the toilet. And then they have an accident in their pants. They poo their pants or they pee their pants. And some parents will say, bad girl, bad, bad. It's, it's like we're, we're not saying what you did was bad. We're saying you're bad, bad girl, bad, you know, Bad, it's almost like bad dog. It's like bad girl. Um, good girl, bad girl. So we learn at a very early age what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And we feel shame. This, this child might feel potty shame. Shame for not being able to control their own bowels. Shame around defecation. Shame around having to go to the bathroom. Embarrassment. Like they start to learn body shaming and that they're disgusting or they're dirty or they're bad. And parents don't mean this in a bad way. Of course, they're teaching their child how to go to the bathroom and the potty. But, and maybe in the beginning, they're like praising like a good girl, you know, you've gone to the bathroom and maybe they don't even say bad girl when they go in their pants. They just say, no, 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 you know, we go on the potty. And that may be all well and good, but maybe a year into it, if the child still goes in their pants, the parent picks them up and says, that's gross, that's disgusting. We don't go in our pants, it's a bad girl, right? So sometimes we're tolerant and sometimes we feel this person should have learned their lesson by now. This child should have learned how to go to the potty. They're past the age where we need to coddle them over this. So we're gonna shame them into going. So of course, none of this is done on a conscious level and I'm not calling parents out there who are toilet training their children bad people. This is just one example of everything we do to children growing up. Um, we teach shame. So shame is something that we learn, but when it becomes chronic, a chronic feeling that fundamentally you are bad, fundamentally you are wrong, fundamentally you are flawed, fundamentally you are unacceptable, fundamentally you are bad, fundamentally you are not you, you are not worthy or worth anything. You are not even worth love. That is so damaging. That can cause 
all kinds of physical, mental, and social illnesses. When we feel like shame over something, often people will hide things. People hide their chronic illness. People hide when they've been abused. People hide when they've been raped. People hide when they've been violently attacked. People hide their religion. People hide, I mean, they can't hide the color of their skin, but people will hide um, their ethnic background or, or their racial background, or people will hide almost anything. Maybe that their parents were poor or that, you know, their income status. People, people hide what they fear will be judged or criticized or looked down on or that will be an embarrassment or that will lead to humiliation that will somehow dishonor them or discredit them or point to them being immoral and lead to them being abandoned and judged and criticized and called out and humiliated, embarrassed, shunned, shamed, um, publicly discredited, publicly um, abandoned and completely unworthy of respect, love, and unworthy of connection, unworthy of belonging and love. I mean, it's so horrifying for people who live with chronic shame that it's no wonder they live with so many mental, physical, and emotional um, illnesses. It harms body image, it harms health, it makes you feel like you're not pretty enough, not beautiful enough, not strong enough, not smart enough. Maybe you're not happy enough, you're not peaceful enough, you're not good enough. It might make you feel unworthy or ugly or disgusting. You know, we body shame people all the time. Girls can barely look in the mirror. They think that they aren't the right weight. They're not the right size. They don't have the right skin. They don't have the right hair. They don't have the right, you know, they, they have too many wrinkles. They have bags here. They have skin here. They are ugly. They don't look good enough. It affects our parenting. Maybe you're a bad mother, a bad father. It makes people feel like they're not a good parent, not nurturing enough, not, they don't discipline their child enough, or maybe they discipline them too much. I mean, there's so many ways that we shame uh, new parents. We, we fear, it, help, it makes people feel like they're unworthy of love, unworthy of connection. It gives people a fear of not being safe in this world, not being protected, not being heard, not being understood. Maybe you're af afraid that you're not successful enough or that you don't have enough money or that your career isn't good enough or your job isn't good, e good enough or you're not worthy. You know, and God forbid that you have to be on, on unemployment or you're homeless, you, you feel shame. I mean, there's, there's such a wide spectrum of shame. It makes people feel numb feel worthless, feel isolated. It makes people angry. It makes people act out. It makes people full of aggression. It makes people people please and put other people's needs before theirs and turn into perfectionists and followers, begging for love, acceptance, attention. So that's why I think that we're in a pandemic right now of shame because when people feel that their safety is threatened and that's what this pandemic is all about, right? This and the fear of this has really put everybody across the world into a fight, flight, or freeze response. People are acting on their basic fear responses. Nobody wants to get this. Nobody wants to get sick. Nobody wants to die. And so when we have been acting for an extended period of time on a basic fear response, looking for safety, searching for safety, looking for numbers in the crowd, wanting to go with the largest herd. And this has gone on. This has really gone on for an extended period of time, right? We're at two years now. So during the best of times, you know, shame is a toxic emotion, but during a pandemic, um, Shame is deadly, shame is toxic. It might be worse than the actual virus. Because we are all in a heightened state of fear, of alertness, we're all experiencing these waves of fears that have gone from the very beginning where the first wave of fear just rippled across the world. 
much like a herd of antler grazing out on the African field and one of them sees a lion. They stand at alert and then within moments, the ripple effect all the way across them, they're all standing on alert. That is what happened to us in the very, very beginning of the pandemic. And rightly so. Nobody knew what it was. Nobody knew who, how bad it was. Nobody knew how you could get it. Nobody knew if you were gonna get it. Nobody knew if you were gonna die or you were, or, or you were gonna live. Fear was spreading like wildfire. And through no fault of our own, our fear response was activated. Our fight, flight, or freeze response was activated. And we started to act out in our most basic, primitive, and primal manners. And so in the beginning, we were all looking to authorities. We were looking to doctors. We were looking to experts because they knew more than us. Um, we were praying that they would have the answers. But now, two years into this, we know that there's valid information on both sides. We know that lots of people have died of this. And we also know that lots of people have died of this. And we also know that there's been injuries and long-term side effects from both. So two years in, we should be looking at the information on both sides. But unfortunately, you know, in the beginning, looking to authorities um, for guidance seemed the right thing to do. And it seems the obvious thing to do. But we didn't realize that there was an, an, a financial gain behind this and in a financial agenda. So we didn't have all the information in the beginning and we didn't know what to do. We legitimately didn't know what to do. So we followed advice that was advice given maybe to help, maybe to save lives, perhaps to follow a financial agenda, perhaps to push a pandemic of fear. But what we do know, what we do know is that two years in, we have evidence mounting on both sides and it's time to stop this shaming, this culturally acceptable and even authority um, backed and pushed propaganda. And it's time to look at the evidence before us without bias on both sides and be able to make up our minds for ourselves. I have to be careful with my words. I have to be careful what I say because I don't want to get taken off the internet. So I'll start by saying that this is only my opinion. However, I do believe that there was an agenda to get everybody across the world. And this was a financial decision. This was a financial decision that was practiced for years prior in the World Economic Forum. Um, they already knew what they were going to do if there was a pandemic and it was mass for the entire world. Now it was a financial driven decision because the ones in charge were going to be profiting by making sure that every person across the world felt so fearful that they would listen. They knew that fear could drive response, could drive a reaction and could drive a result. And so the ones in power, the ones making these, the ones profiting off, the pharmaceutical companies profiting off this and the government's uh, funding and being funded by them and working hand in hand, um, pushed an agenda, a financial agenda, and used mass fear to usher this in. And when the news media outlets are putting up horrifying numbers day after day, moment after moment, and we're living in fear, okay, because these numbers, they're scrolling across our news, um, everybody's talking about it. The fear of death from this is, is overwhelming and super scary. Then, of course, we all want to protect ourselves and our family. And this is, I think, what those in power were banking on. This is what they were literally, quite literally, financially banking on. But when the establishments started to experience resistance, when studies started coming out showing otherwise, when they started coming out showing the dangers of these, when we started seeing the injuries surface, when we started seeing videos go viral, when we started seeing numbers of people who'd gotten this, who've been injured and hurt, when we started seeing emails and lies come to the to come surface when we started to have people resist or say no. When the establishment started to feel a resistance, they immediately launched into an already pre-planned and pre-coordinated attempt to shame 
anyone and everyone who wasn't following public health or government guidelines, they went into a public shaming response. And I do believe that this effort was coordinated. It started with pre-studied statements being released, ones that would play on shame, ones that would play on fear. They even studied the effect, what, what sentences, what actual sentences will make most people comply. What is the lowest denominator that we can gain compliance quickly, especially in the face of resistance? And this was even a study done early on by Yale University. And this study was done just before they rolled out, just before they rolled these out. And the study was to test different statements and different messaging on how to best persuade people to comply. Because establishments, because, um, the medical establishments, the pharmaceutical establishments, government establishments have been know about the tactics of shame and they use them way back when they would um, shame people publicly. Now that's, that's been made illegal now. Um, but we still see it, even though it was made illegal, even in China, there's some videos, horrifyingly uh, recent videos where they would take people across the streets of China and drive them through like cattle and publicly shaming them while everyone's standing on the streets for not complying with any measures, uh, with any and all measures from the government. So even though these practices are illegal, they still go on. And the way that they can go on be allowed to happen in the age of 2022 is to indoctrinate so many people into a belief, into an ideology, into a narrative, and then give permission to shame all others that don't. We see this on CNN, we see this on the news, we see this on talk shows, we see this all over the place. We see people even suggesting and saying, I think these people need to be publicly shamed and humiliated and they need to die, they need to, I mean, the, the, the things that are, are being said are pretty horrific. So we know that when we get a group of local community or family and friends who are abandoning you because you have a different personal belief than they are, we know that most people are gonna bend. So the amount of division right now, even going on in the public light, by the government standing up in Canada, for instance, and saying these people have unacceptable views. Um, in the United States, by saying our patience is wearing thin. These types of statements coming from government officials give the rest of the world permission to be mean, to publicly attack. It's like giving permission to the schoolyard bullies to bully. We're giving permission to everyone across the world to, to be the bullies and to enforce this through, um, and the weaponization is through something that is invisible and it's called shaming. Right now, um, the governments and those in power have made it morally, they are trying to make it morally unacceptable for somebody to think anything negative about this. And don't forget, this is all driven by a financial profit decision. But when we turn financial profits into, it is morally the right decision and the right choice to do this, then anybody who doesn't do that is Im immoral. And anyone who's immoral deserves to be ridiculed, embarrassed, shamed, rejected, abandoned, right? All the things that we talked about that shame is. So this is shaming on a public scale on a grand worldwide scale. We are labeling people as murderers if they don't get this. Never mind that the people giving this could be the ones that are the murderers due to all the side effects that we now know and all the deaths that have arisen from people taking this. But never mind that. We're going to call the people who haven't complied murderers, grandma killers baby killers. I mean, it's very, very nasty, especially in the online world. The comments, 
that we all know that online bullies can, can do are so psychologically damaging. And this is why we tell our kids not to engage in online bullying, but suddenly morality trumps that. Morality is the excuse to allow online bullying between grown-ups worldwide right now. There's many news organizations and government agencies and big business coming out of big tech um, specifically aimed and targeting people to make them feel immoral, bad, disgusting, wrong, right? Even all of this going on, even the whole label of misinformation that's being slapped on everybody, ruining careers, discrediting people who don't deserve to be discredited. This is propaganda that, mind you, before they even rolled out, they were studying, researchers were studying this at Yale University on how to use social media and how to get everybody to believe and to buy into um, that this is the right moral choice and how do we publicly shame anyone who has a different view, who has a different moral or ethical stand, who even the injured are being targeted and shamed for speaking out about their injuries. I mean, it has gotten absolutely so ridiculous. I mean, we're, we're, we're back to something like the Salem uh, witch trials where they, where they burned these women for being witches. Obviously, you know, we know that witches don't exist and um, it was one of the world's greatest crimes and, and we're back to shaming people publicly we're back to hunting down and trying to hunt down anybody who is on this. It's a war of the un, you know, on this. I mean, we see these headlines. The, the, this is a pandemic of the un, which isn't true. That is furthest from the truth that it could be. But again, remember, this started playing on fear and now is playing on people's sense of of righteousness and ego, people who bought into this and who want to be right and who are invested in being right and who don't wanna see the other side, wanna hold up their morality by making others wrong. There always has to be an, um, an enemy and the government has decided that the bad guy in this pandemic is anybody who shows dissension, is anybody who has questioned these. And so what do we do? We publicly censor, we publicly shame, and we hold it up in the news, in our schools, and we hold up the virtue of morality as a viable excuse to publicly shame, humiliate, and treat people the way we would never tell our children to treat anyone. We're suddenly allowed to go against these moral values that we have because the trump card is that you're more moral than that person saying no because you are doing the right thing. And that's publicly enforced by the news media and by the governments, not for public safety, not for public health, but for financial decisions. So there's a lot of talk about misinformation and there's a lot of censorship being applied, but misinformation seems to be the real propaganda these days. Slapping a term conspiracy theory on somebody to immediately discredit them seems to be praised, morally praised um, to discredit people. So the government, pharmaceutical companies, the, the the, the people in charge, the people in power, and everybody know that the way to get somebody to um, hide away, to be quiet, to stop speaking, just to stop speaking out, to stop taking any kind of a moral stand, to stop contradicting, to stop questioning, which in this case we need. We need scientific questioning. We need the scientific debates. We need to hear both sides or we cannot and will not make an educated decision. But the way to squash all that, that they've known forever, that everybody knows, is through shaming, public shaming. We've done it all throughout history. And it is tearing apart family and friends. It is tearing apart communities. It's tearing apart 
schools and children and companies. It's tearing apart families and husbands and wives and parents and children. And nobody wants to be shamed. The reason why we have such a high rate of compliance is because people are afraid to be shamed. People don't want to be abandoned. People don't want to be judged. They don't want to be criticized and they don't want to lose any family or friends or have anybody say or look down upon them for anything that they do. And this is the real reason that we have such a high compliant rate because it most certainly isn't scientific because if you're actually looking at the numbers and actually looking at the evidence on both sides, which the media is only looking at one side, the government is only looking at one side and the pharmaceutical companies are only looking at one side. But when you're looking at the other side, okay, the reason why there's such high compliance is because of fear, fear of what might happen, fear of death. The fear has been overinflated and used to get people to comply. And when that failed, we went to shaming. We went to a coordinated effort of tactical worldwide shaming. And the psychological, the physical and the mental, the emotional impacts of this coordinated shame, shaming is going to be felt for years and decades to come because shame is lethal and shame is so harmful. And because they know that they use that and they allow everybody else to use that. And so if you're shaming somebody because you're feeling righteous or you're spreading the good moral word coming from somebody who is making a profit, I want you to stop and look inside because the shame that you inflict on someone else on behalf of someone else is very harmful and it's not only going to harm that person, but it's going to harm you too. Because by having people in your life that you love feeling this amount of shame will not only affect them, but it will affect your relationship with them. It will affect everybody in this world, including children. The shaming happening on children and school children right now is going to be felt. For years and years to come because when children don't think that they've done something wrong but they believe that they are wrong when they are bad people there's almost like a black mark on their heart and it makes them hide it makes them lose confidence in themselves it makes them lose confidence that they're worthy and that they're loved and that it's okay to have boundaries and to draw boundaries for yourself and to have your own opinion. We're taking the ability of children to learn that it's okay to say no, that it's okay to stand up for yourself, that it's okay to question things, that it's okay to hear and look at both sides, that we shouldn't bully, that we shouldn't shame, that we shouldn't judge and criticize. We're teaching our children right now so many lessons that we don't even know we're teaching them. And we're building a generation of people whose foundational emotions are going to be built on fear, guilt, shame, anger, sadness, loneliness. I mean, this has been a fearful situation for children. But the consequences of shaming are really far reaching. And I'm not even talking about masks here. This isn't even what, you know, I don't care. But children have grown up now for years, for two years. That's a long time in a child's life wearing this, seeing this. We're, we're taking facial recognition. You know, we don't get that expression anymore. We're seeing children, babies, infants. Their development is now being stalled. They're having a hard time, they're having a hard time speaking, learning, their IQs are down. I mean, this is, these are studies that have been done. Speech development is at all time low for, for infants over the pandemic. And 
Nobody wants to hurt anybody. Nobody wants anyone to die. But it's important now, two years in, for us to look at the other factors, the financial, the economic, the social economic, the sociological, the psychological effects that wearing a mask all day, isolating, locking down, not seeing our loved ones, and even the shame campaign on people who have a different opinion has been extreme. And we're teaching children to either be shamed and accept shame and that they're dirty and bad and wrong, or to be the shamers because they're right and they're, they're morally superior. I mean, this is going to have far reaching psychological impacts. Okay, so what do we do about this? Especially if you're the one being publicly shamed and publicly targeted. Um, so first of all, if you're experiencing shame, regardless of whether it's uh, this extreme pandemic shame, if you're just experiencing shame from any other thing that has happened in your past or your childhood or an experience that's caused you deep shame, the first step is to meet shame head on, is to allow yourself to feel shame, to allow those feelings to be there, and then to talk about that shame. See, when we hide, when we push down, when we reject or deny or turn away from or try to hide or isolate because of this deep shame, shame grows. Shame always grows in the darkness. So the number one thing for anybody experiencing shame, and particularly now during this pandemic of shame, I would say standing up, speaking out, telling your reason, being brave, having courage, showing truth, showing statistics, showing what you've uncovered, telling the story. When we share our shame, and it's met with empathy by somebody, then the shame goes away. The shame is healed, the shame is repaired. So just like somebody who was sexually abused as a child and feels deep shame that maybe it was their fault, that they were the ones who did something wrong, that they're to blame somehow. When this child grows up holding on to this belief and keeping this inside and hiding this, the shame is going to grow and stay with them, you know, through their life. But when they bring it up, when they talk about the shame, when they talk about what they experienced and they're met with an empathetic ear from a therapist or a friend or anyone who says it wasn't your fault, I'm sorry that happened to you. You know, that wasn't right. When we're met with empathy, when we bring shame up, shame can heal and shame can dissolve. The problem with the shame on the pandemic, pandemic right now is that when people bring their shame up, they're ridiculed further. And just like the person who was sexually assaulted as a child, if they bring that up and the people they tell that to on authority, a police officer, um, a parent, and that person says, I don't believe you. You're making this up. It must have been your fault. What were you wearing? What did you do to bring that on, right? The shame continues. The shame grows. And that person remembers, I, may, I must never bring this up again. I must hide this forever because it is, it is so wrong. And I am so wrong. And I am so bad that if I bring it up, people will know that I'm bad, that I'm wrong. And I never want to feel like that again, because not only was the initial abuse so horrifying to me, but often what is more scarring to people, what is longer lasting is the shame, is the effects of shame, is the person telling them that yes, indeed, they brought this on themselves or they were wrong or they were bad or they did it or they caused it. And it's this shame that is often so hard for victims of anything to get over. 
rather than the event itself, rather than the wrong itself, rather than the thing itself, it's the shame. And that's why they continue to hide. And that's why their self-esteem continues to be low throughout the rest of their life because they never build confidence in themselves to stand up and say to themselves, I wasn't wrong. This was wrong. This happened to me and it wasn't right. And that person's wrong, not me, but they never grow that confidence because people squash that confidence and added on more shame when they did talk about it. So the first thing I would tell you to do if you're shaming someone to stop because this is hurting people psychologically for years to come and you don't know if you are right because you have not looked at both sides. I can guarantee anyone who's shaming right now is doing it on propaganda based messaging from the news and the organizations and the powers who are writing these sentences and spreading them and they have not done their own research, they're not looking at the VARS database, they're not checking out the studies from the CDC, they don't have personal experience to tell them otherwise. Um, and so this shaming is unfounded. And you could be implicated in really hurting somebody, especially if you don't know, if you're not sure. So the first thing is to stop shaming. If you're being shamed, you are going to need to learn to grow your self-confidence. You're going to need to learn to grow your self-love, your self-acceptance. It's always an inside job, meaning we must build our self-confidence, our self-love, our self-worth from the inside. So this, we can do a lot of different techniques to bring this up, to work, to do some inner child work. We can talk to therapists about, there's so many things that we can do to build our own confidence in our beliefs, in our choices, in our experiences, in our own feelings, and to know that we're not wrong for having them. So the first thing is to know that you're not wrong. You're not bad. You don't deserve this shame. Give yourself the gift of empathy, self-empathy, self-compassion, self-love, and then find somebody that you can trust, that you know loves you unconditionally, and talk to them. Say, I feel terrible because I feel like I'm bad and dirty and wrong and a murderer, but I have really good reasons and I don't think they're wrong. You tell someone, you talk about the shame, you, talk, you let the shame out. To somebody who's empathetic and somebody who will love you and tell you it's okay and then the shame can dissolve. But right now we have shame on such an epic, massive worldwide scale and shaming is being encouraged and allowed and celebrated. There is a very strong yearning inside every one of us to be seen, to be heard, to be connected, to be understood and to be loved. We all have this really deep need to belong and to be accepted. And so if this pandemic finds you withdrawing and feeling weak and bad about yourself and lowering your self-esteem and those in power are trying to discredit or ruin you, family and friends are trying to judge criticize, shame, guilt you, please know you are not alone. You are not alone. This shaming is going on, but there are thousands. There are tens of thousands. There are hundreds of thousands, and there are even millions across the world who feel the exact same way you do and who are also being publicly targeted and shamed. And the split that you feel inside your soul and inside your heart for the yearning to belong, but the yearning to follow that voice inside yourself and, and the knowing that you are right and what you're standing up for right now across the world, personal freedom is right. There's a split that's happening. And so we need to feed the side that's doing the right thing, that voice inside you that knows what is right and what is wrong 
and that leads you down a different moral path. We need to stop allowing ourselves to feel discredited or to feel immoral or to feel wronged. We need to build our self-esteem, hold our heads up high and stand solidly in our beliefs. We need to connect with others who have same similar values and beliefs because there are many. And when we bind together, when we bond together over this, we can grow our own sense of connection and belonging and feeling safe, but we do not want to start a two-tiered division of the world, this side and this side. That's not ultimately what we want. The only reason that we will connect with people on this side, and I encourage you to do that, is so that you don't feel so alone and you can start to come out of your shell and stop withdrawing and start holding your head up and start connecting again and start having belief in your own morals and belief in your own convictions and belief in yourself, belief in your goodness, belief, belief in your worth as a human being. And once you can do that, you can spread that to others. You can spread that to the others on the other side. It's like spreading that to the schoolyard bully. You can, you know, find a couple of friends who aren't bullying you, feel a little better about yourself and then have confidence. You can stand up for yourself. You can believe in yourself. You can give yourself compassion and empathy and understanding and love. You can give all the things to yourself that you're hoping that you need from the world. You can give it to yourself. So this time may be a time of deep personal growth as you have to look deep inside and overcome this shame that has been wrongly placed on you and grow your own capacity for self-love, self-empathy, self-understanding, self-growth, self-esteem, self-forgiveness, self-value. So this time, you know, is a time of self-reflection. And I urge everybody to meditate, to take a quiet self-reflection from their time for themselves every day and to look inward, to build your inner voice, to build your inner confidence, to build your inner strength, to see the value, the deep value in yourself, to allow that goodness and kindness and love within your heart to expand and to grow. And then you can see and reflect the goodness in others. You can have sympathy and compassion for them doing what they're doing to you. You can have sympathy and compassion because they're in, they're in a fear response. They're buying the propaganda because they're in fear, because they're scared for their own inability to withstand shame if, God forbid, they have questions or they don't wanna to continue to go along with this. So really, we need to give love to them. We need to spread light to them. We need to spread truth to them. We need to see the value in them and the fear in them and connect on a personal level with empathy for our fellow human beings. So I would urge you to take time every day for yourself, to connect with yourself first, then connect with people who you love, connect with other people in your family regardless of who holds what views on this topic. I would urge you to turn off the news. I would urge you to turn off the propaganda. I would urge you to find somebody that you can love and trust and talk to. I would urge you to start treating yourself like a child, like your child, a child of God, who is worthy of unconditional love and unconditional acceptance, just because you're you. And I would encourage you to stand up and publicly share your thoughts and your story, to hold your head up high and to share who you are and what you believe. And the more we spread this message of courage and strength by standing up for our own beliefs, not just repeating the propaganda handed down to us, but when we stand up and talk from a deep place inside of us, we can spread truth and light to the rest of the world. We help to heal this divide that's going on. Get off social media. Don't respond or react to the comments, to the ridicule, to the vicious online attacks, to terrible words like 
I mean, that are truly going around from our own governments right now and our own prime minister, um, that maybe you're a domestic terrorist or you're a horrible human being, you have unacceptable views, you're, you shouldn't be tolerated. I mean, these are horrible, horrible statements. And we just turn that off. Turn off the news, turn off these comments. Practice the art of being unaffected. Look inside, look to your inner voice, look to your own moral compass, to your own sense of right and wrong. Love yourself, be empathetic to yourself, be compassionate to yourself, and spread that to the rest of the world. Because the sooner we all start spreading understanding and compassion and empathy, the sooner we can end this pandemic of shame. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, give it a like, share it to anyone you think is experiencing this problem right now, and go watch my other videos on shame. Um, and I will see you in the next video.